Today, we are in a discussion with the International Science Council, 50 centuries of science publications. What can we say about this important subject? Well, first, let us review the past. For certainly what we know of science is thanks to the fact that it was written down in various periods and times. And then we will move past those 50 centuries to the present, where we are building on the past and we are incubating the future. And then we'll look at the glimpses of the future, which looks like it's going to be a very alien world. So let us start with the past, 50 centuries of science. We want to review a start with the invention of writing, and then we'll go through the history of humanity dealing with this topic. On the invention of writing, it appeared primarily in either Mesopotamia or the Nile Valley, and that was over 7,000 years ago, where great civilizations were started by settlements around these great rivers. And in Mesopotamia, they used a stylus and clay tablets to write in what is known as cuneiform, which is a system of writing first developed by the ancient Sumerians of Mesopotamia around 3500 to 3000 before our common era. There are many such clay tablets that survived in the various museums of the world, and we're happy that they did because they gave us some glimpses of that early civilization. So the stylus was used specifically to produce these kinds of wedge-shaped uh, types of letters. And it was sometimes baked afterwards so the clay would harden. Sometimes it was allowed to work. Now, Egyptians also used clay tablets, but they used also stone and something else, which was marvelous for the Egyptian civilization, which was papyrus. This was an enormous advantage because it could produce an easy service to write on and to carry and to store. It was basically an early form of paper that could be produced from the papyrus plant, which was beaten down into a paper type structure that produced a scroll. And after the sheets were dried, they were used for keeping records. And these sheets were then rolled up and tied with papyrus string and it allowed the scribe not to be limited by the cuneiform shape of the stylus, but in fact to write in free form on the papyrus, which was like today's paper. And these scrolls could be quite big and allowed great flexibility for the authors to use color and to use designs and to write in different ways. Now, more formally, they would write also hieroglyphic writing on stone, like in many monuments that Egypt possesses to this day. And of course, most famous of all the scripts from the ancient times is the Rosetta Stone, written uh, in three languages, Demotic and Greek. And it allowed for 19th century to be able to decipher the ancient Egyptian language, which was written on hieroglyphics on various monuments and in various writing. Now, ancient Egypt had an amazing civilization, and certainly, in terms of science, it played a very big role. Imhotep is the first human being whose name has been recorded, not because he was a king or a conqueror, but because he actually was an extremely intelligent and intellectual person. He was the advisor or vizier to the Pharaoh Djoser of the fourth dynasty. And uh, he helped build the stepped pyramid of Saqqara, but he was also a very skilled physician. And he became, in fact, the god of medicine. Imhotep is the inventor of medicine. Almost 5,000 years ago in Egypt, he said that disease and injury are things to be studied clinically and which can be treated by surgery and herbs and do not require magic. The beginning of the scientific approach. So, 
he was the builder of the Saqqara pyramid for the pharaoh Zoser, the precursor of all the pyramids that would later come in Egyptian history. And he was so good at medicine that the Egyptians made him the god of medicine. And I tease my friends and say, and how's that for a merit-based promotion for a commoner to become a god? Now, the oldest piece that we have dealing with this issue is something known as the Edwin Smith Papyrus, which was purchased in the 19th century by an Egyptologist called Edwin Smith. And it was later on uh, translated and written in transliteration by the great uh, Dr. Breasted. And uh, it is the earliest known medical document. Now, this particular document was written in about 1600 BC, but it is thought to be based on material from as early as 3000 BC. And when people say, well, how can you know? I'd say like, if I were to copy today a text from Shakespeare and you would read it, you would say, that's not the English of the 21st century. That's exactly the way they know and can place the origin of that to 3000 BC. And it's an ancient textbook on trauma surgery. It describes anatomical observations and the examination and diagnosis of numerous injuries in great detail. And most important, the ancient Egyptians were the first to give a name to the brain and to describe the brain in great detail from the cranial sutures, the menages, the external surface of the brain, the cerebrospinal fluid, and the intracranial pulsations are all described in great detail. And that is how they would write the word brain. So it contains also the first descriptions of cranial structures and the meninges, and it describes very realistic anatomical, physiological, and pathological observations. But most importantly, in that papyrus is the first time that the word brain appears in any language. They also understood the link of one side of the brain to the control of the other side of the body, and there is evidence that they knew of the differential effect of trauma to one side of the brain or another. And of course, they knew about trephination and the surgical procedure to drill to remove the pressure of the fluid. We know that from these early starts, certainly, there was an enormous development as Egyptians continued to move towards mummification of the human body. So they had exquisite knowledge of the various parts of the body and what they did and how they could continue to be available. Now, separately, separately, there is another ancient papyrus, the so-called Ebers papyrus, which is complete. It is the oldest book in the world. It was written about 1500 BC, from, copied from material perhaps going as far back as 3400 BC. It's a 110 page scroll, which is about 20 meters long. And it's one of the most complete descriptions of the state of medical knowledge and practice around 3700 years ago. And here I am with specialists and including the librarian of Leipzig, uh, Ulrich Schneider, and a piece of the famous Ebers papyrus in front of us. And it's being kept and will be presented in the Leipzig library very soon. So in there, they define the heart as the center of the blood supply with vessels attached for every member of the body. Mental disorders such as depression and dementia are also covered. The description suggests that mental and physical diseases were considered in the same way as diseases. The Egyptians about 3,000 years ago also created uh, prosthetic limbs and false teeth. And if you go to a temple in Komombo, which is a more recent temple in the Ptolemaic period, you will find this on the walls, which is the list of surgical instruments that were being used by the ancient Egyptians. And right next to the surgical instruments is a list of the medical prescriptions, what herbs to take, how many times a day, what hours, etc. And did they know about hours? As a matter of fact, yes. They had clocks for both night and day. 
And if you look at something else like the Rhine mathematical papyrus, you will understand something else about that civilization and its approach to science and engineering. Egyptians were primarily engineers. The Greeks were much more concerned with complete theories. Uh, the Egyptians wanted viable solutions. So, for example, the pragmatism of the Egyptians, they knew all about a three, four, five triangle, and they used a knotted rope with this length to produce a right angle in field work. They had a magnificent approach to define the area of a circle. Take the diameter, take eight ninth of the diameter, and square it. You get the area of the circle almost precisely because it requires a pi of 3.16 instead of 3.14, etc. So that was good enough for the Egyptians to work with. It was later on the Greeks who in the first millennium BC would be producing the philosophy and the theory that we still admire so much to today. So passing the torch to Greece, many of the great Greeks like Plato and Pythagoras would visit Egypt and learn from its temples and soon they built the great edifice of learning in ancient Greece that we all admire to this day. This is of course a Renaissance painting of the great science and philosophy represented in the so-called academy. Some of the greatest names of course uh, met with uh, difficulties and uh, Socrates uh, would be forced to bring Hemlock and uh, commit suicide. And uh, Plato, who was an Athenian philosopher during the classical period, was the founder of the Platonist school and the academy, the first institution of higher learning in the Western world. And one of the greatest students, of course, was Aristotle, who established logic and was a true polymath in any definition. He was the founder of the Lyceum, the Peripatetic School of Philosophy, and he tutored a young man called Alexander, who would become known to the world as Alexander the Great. And he was uh, educated himself at the Platonic Academy. Pythagoras uh, was the founder of Pythagorism, and his political and religious teachings were well known, and he was a major influence on all of philosophy, and of course his famous theorem is an example of how a mathematical proof is used to prove that all right-angled triangles uh, can in fact have this property where the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the two other sides. But there were many other very distinguished mathematicians and scientists, Doxus, Democritus, Alice of Miletus, and Asclepius was the Greek god of medicine with his uh, uh, famous staff with a snake around it, and Hippocrates, uh, after whom the Hippocratic Oath is still used to this day by many doctors. And it was that fusion that came from ancient Greece through Alexander and the Hellenistic expansion and merged with Egypt and with other knowledge to create what would be known as the great Hellenistic civilization that came in the wake of Alexander's great empire and the nucleus, the beacon of that culture would be the ancient library of Alexandria.